My name is Gohan Muhammad. I'm your moderator for today, but actually before I was a moderator, before I started participating in the festival, I was a Library of Congress employee for eight years, so I'm happy to be with you again today. We're joined on the stage by two fantastic gentlemen, the first being Pedro Martin. He was a Hallmark artist for 27 years and is a creator of Asteroid Andy cartoon shorts. His debut book is a graphic novel memoir about his childhood in the 1970s in which he travels with his large family to Mexico to pick up his legendary grandfather, who may or may not have been part of the Mexican Revolutionary, also may or may not be a Jedi. We we'll find that out in the book. Martin's debut, Mexi Kid, is presented to you here at the Book Festival. Please stick around after their conversation. There'll be book signing as well. I'm joined on the stage also by Jared Krasowska, a friend at this point. I met him when I first moved to DC at my first Library of Congress job. Um, he's a New York Times bestselling author, two-time winner of a Children's Choice Book Award, an Eisner Award nominee, and the author and illustrator of more than 30 books for young readers. This is when you clap. <laughs> That's why it said that parentheses. This is when you clap. It's in there. No. I, it's I, was, in there I was doing it because I'm like, okay, this is crazy. Why am I up here <laughs> Stop with it. this man? 30 Absolutely plus. belong up here, man. His critically acclaimed Lunch Lady graphic novel series and the Platypus Police Squad novel series, he's also the host of, report, of Book Report with JJK on Sirius XM's Place Live, a weekly segment celebrating books, authors, and reading. Krasowska lives in Massachusetts with his family, and his new nonfiction graphic series, Sunshine, is what we're presenting you today. So thank you and welcome thank to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe both authors have prepared a presentation for you, so we're going to dive right into that and okay. enjoy. So I am you on a go leash around? here, and I'm going to step there. Authors and in the wild. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, I think so. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a little bit uh, behind the scenes of how I created uh, my graphic memoir, Sunshine, and a little bit about just how I work, how you go from having a general concept to then, like, eventually you have a, a printed book. And so you might be familiar with Hey Kiddo, which was my, my first graphic memoir. And so, uh, to, so to clarify some, some, some you know, vocabulary, sometimes people get confused. Like, what's a comic book versus a graphic novel? Okay, a comic book is like a magazine, and a graphic novel is like a novel, right? Uh, well, what is a graphic memoir? It's, it's a memoir that's told through comics, right? Through, through the art form of the graphic novel, for lack of a better expression. So, so I, I, I've been taken recently to saying graphic literature because it encompasses graphic novels and it encompasses graphic nonfiction, or in this case, graphic memoir. Um, when I was writing Hey Kiddo, so I, I like to think of the full picture when I'm working on, on a book. I like to have a macro view, a bird's eye view of everything. So step one for me in organizing my ideas for a memoir is writing memories down on post-it notes. Placing those post-it notes on a bulletin board where I can really move them around and see how I want this to be reveal, revealed to the reader. But there was one chapter that just did not fit into the through line of Hey Kiddo. And that one chapter was about my time working at a camp for children with life-threatening illnesses. But that experience was pivotal to my development and to the motivation of the Jarrett character in the book to seek out his birth father. And so that whole chapter became one page in Hey Kiddo. But that, that story needed to be told. And so instead of being told in a chapter, it was told in a whole book unto of itself. Sunshine, how one camp taught me about life, death, and hope. So I write my graphic literature out as scripts. Just like one would write a, a, a movie or a TV show or a stage play, I write a script. I'll have stage direction, which is what you're going to see in the visuals. And the character's dialogue will be centered in, in the document, just like a script is. That script gets edited. And then I have to take my story and turn it into a visual. And I start with just sketches because things are going to change still. Things are going to be edited and moved around. But then eventually I move to the final work, which then you see in the printed book. So there are some steps that go from sketches to the, the final book. And I create my art uh, with physical media. And that physical media and is then scanned into the computer. And in Photoshop, I combine the various pieces of physical media to make it look like one comprehensive piece of artwork. So 
while it, it looks like it was all done with physical media, only about 50% of it was made with physical media. The rest was done using Photoshop, putting everything in layers, um, using digital brushes that might recreate the look of physical media, be it digital watercolors or digital Conti crayons. So it both gives me you know, the control over using digital media, but the rawness of, of using traditional media. And of course, copy editing. So copy editing, of course, is crucial, but it's a different process when it's a piece of graphic literature, because then you have to go back into those Photoshop files and, and correct the grammar or catch any sort of misspellings that are there. And because this is memoir, I also dive deep into my memories, be it with photographs, letters. Uh, I, I, was, I was that teenager in the 90s that had a camcorder everywhere he went. And so I digitized all of those VHS tapes to, to revisit these voices and these environments for, for that I cared so much about. And again, that experience of reliving those memories to organizing my ideas, to scripting, to sketching, to editing all of that, to creating the, the physical media that then gets scanned in and digitized and using digital media and then copy editing until eventually I get to hold a copy of the book in my hand. And so it's a very long process. It takes, it takes years upon years. Uh, and if you really start, if you really were to time it of like when you started thinking about the book to when the book is finished, you know, that could be five or 10 years depending on the book. But when you, are, when you sign that contract, you typically have a year, year and a half or so to get everything done. And when you finish all of the work, it takes about a year for, for that book to be released. Uh, we, I, I also am very proud of the audiobook adaptations of my graphic literature, and I'm very heavily involved with them. And it's sort of like a stage play, like a radio play, where there are different voices for the different characters. Uh, because we're, we're adapting the, the visual for an audible experience, we're adding new narration, we're adding perhaps pieces of dialogue, and um, so on and so forth. So, Mr. Pedro. Oh, for you, my guy. <laughs> Thank you. My leash. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. I can't remember what slides I put on here, so let's all go through it together. Um, one of the things that I was going to tell you about, you know, about the process, and I know Jared had talked about like this, like. It takes years and years and years to kind of do this kind of work. And my journey with this story and the stories that kind of contributed to this started like about 27 years ago, actually. When I first started at Hallmark, uh, I was a greeting card artist at Shoebox. And you get like four cards to do a week. And that week was yours. However you wanted to do those cards, you just turn them in by Friday, you're good. So I would power through those <laughs> and get them done by Tuesday. And I would just sit there for days, just doing nothing. But one of the things I liked to do was uh, scribble these little stories that I had from my childhood and put them on these little three by five cards. And at Hallmark, three by five cards are like the currency of ideas. Like every idea worth doing started at a, on a three by five. And actually like that, you know, the, the phrase, uh, when you care enough to send the very best, that was a three by five. Somebody wrote that down and threw it at somebody's chair and it went all the way up to the, the boss. So. So that was kind of thing. Everybody had these stacks. So I would do these stacks of stories, one panel story on one card at a time, and I would throw them in this Batman lunchbox that I had for years and years. And when I left Hallmark and I was unpacking at home, I found that lunchbox, and I found all those cards. And I'm like, oh, these things. I'm like, I wanted to do something with these. So I started rewriting them, putting them together, and I eventually put them online as uh, uh, this uh, thing on Instagram called Mexican Stories. And so every week I would put out a new story. It was about 20 panels long from my childhood. And after a couple of years, I'm like, you know, hey, I think I want to do something with these. And so I pitched it as an <clears throat> as a idea for a book. Let's see what the, okay, um, I, I, now I remember what the slides are. <laughs> so I pitched it as an idea for a book uh, and, and everybody rejected it, um, except for the, my agent who, who said, yes, this is terrible. But there was one line in the book or in the pitch that said, oh, my family goes on this trip to Mexico 
to get my grandfather. It gets really dark, and I don't want to talk about it. And that was the line. And he's like, that's the story. Tell me that story. I'm like, really, that story? I'm like, OK. So that's where this story began. Um, let's see what we got. So the, the ideas of the story about my family going on this big trip and that, that Winnebago was part of the, the uh, drive down there. And in this book, I started to kind of have to explain my family and explain myself to the world, which was kind of hard if you've ever had to explain yourself to anybody. You think you know what you're talking about, but when you start like digging into it, you're like, you know, I don't know myself enough to explain myself. So a lot of that journey was like a self-discovery journey. Um, so once I started kind of down that path, I started writing this up as like this kind of just a narrative story with little pictures to kind of put together my ideas. And this is kind of what it looked like in my office in the basement once I started into the sketch process. Um, I was told I could do like anywhere between 250 to 300 pages worth of artwork for this book, and I had never done that before, and I was just like, okay, and so I just plowed through it, and when I got to the end, when the sketches were due, I looked at the page count, and it was like 320 pages, and I'm like, oh, this is awesome, perfect, and so I'm like, and then suddenly I realized, like, oh, this isn't 320 pages, this is 320 spreads. This story is 640 pages long. <laughs> Sand. <laughs> So I sent it, and then a couple weeks later, it took forever. The silence was, was monstrous. It took, took a, this long time for the editor to get back to me and said, no, I'm sorry, you can't. We, we don't do this. It's, it's fiscally irresponsible to do a book this long. And so I had to cut it down by half. So, so that took a little bit of time to figure out. But anyway, here's the process. Uh, I know Jared talked about his process. I think we work very similarly with the sketches. So I start with kind of just blocking in shapes and color per page. And then I go over it and I do my pencil work on it. And then eventually I get to the inking and coloring. And this is all digital. Um, the, the original pitch was all in pencil. And then I, I finally figured out how to do digital. Um, a lot of the book has flashbacks to the past and, and memories that are distorted. And so I kind of had to come up with different ways to explain that when we were in one mode and another. And so this kind of softer historical style kind of came across. Um, like I said, this is kind of how it starts. It starts with just a, a pencil, or yeah, just a pencil drawing to start the idea off. And then I break it down and I start adding to it. And one of the things within the story is that I hear these stories about my grandfather who we're going to pick up, and the stories are kind of legendary within the family, and everybody hypes them up so much. So in my brain at that age of you know, 12, 13 years old, I kind of saw them as like these comic book adventures. And so I kind of felt like, oh, I need to draw these in this comic book style, not realizing that I was not great at comic book style. <laughs> I was like, OK, so I had to kind of like do my best and look at my reference and try to get something going. So this is kind of what it ended up looking like. And I love doing these fight scenes. I just I never get to do these fight scenes at Hallmark for some reason. <laughs> They, they frowned upon it. <laughs> uh, and then it was really fun to draw my brothers and sisters. You know, I had to like pick them at the right age and really tell the story as best I could and, and not be super mean to them. So um, I hope I did them. There's no lawsuits so far, so I'm, I'm thinking I did OK. And then the, we also uh, kind of map out the, the, the course of the trip here a little bit. And then uh, this is one of the, my favorite pieces this is when we finally get to Mexico and we get to the Mercado and start looking around and suddenly I realize like, oh my gosh, everything is beautiful. And they have so many action figures and I'm in heaven. So, um, so anyway, that's how I put this book together. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you have read either of the books? Really awesome. So I'm sure you found some things to relate to. And for me, I found things to relate to in both of them. I'm an immigrant to the US. I'm from a really large family. I've got five siblings. And so my parents often also would pack us into a van and take us to the closest place they could for us for a few days. And Jared, my mom is a cancer survivor. So that really resonated with me as well. You both dive into really personal matters. And you're vulnerable throughout the books, through comedy, through superheroes, through art. Pedro, and we can start with you. When did you know you had to tell this story? 
Um, I had been wanting to tell the story for a long time. I just didn't know how. And that was kind of the, the thing. I was trying to figure out, like, how do you tell a story about people you love through your own personal memory without, you know, without hurting them, you know, paying them their due, but also telling this intriguing story. So it just took me a long time to mature enough to be able to be like, I think I can tell this story now. I think I have the tools. And that whole Mexican stories that's online, that two years, was kind of like my test bed for telling the story. Like I figured things out. I figured how my voice worked, and I figured out how my parents' voice worked, and how to uh, have comedy in there while telling kind of a darker story. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you. Jared? Yeah, uh, similarly, you know, you get to the point, it's not a question of like, oh, I want to write this book. Like, I, 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 I need to, right? Like, I've, I've had this in the back of my mind. And for the longest time, you think, I, I'm, I'm, I might want to make this until you realize you, you need to. And for me, the, the big transition came was I was able to deliver a TED Talk about the experiences of growing up, uh, being raised by my grandparents because I didn't know who my father was, because my mother was incarcerated because of her addiction to heroin. And that TED Talk was the first time I spoke publicly about these childhood experiences. And, and as I toured the country with my Lunch Lady graphic novels, everywhere I went, I would meet young people and, and adults who would say, you know what, I really connected with that because you know, they're, they're either a, a kid had an incarcerated parent or was being raised by an uncle because of a drug addiction at home. And so it really was this moment of like, oh, I, I need to write this because this story is, is needed out there. Um, and you do need maturity to write about these things, and you need time away. So I started thinking about writing Hey Kiddo when I was about 21 years old. It wasn't called Hey Kiddo then, but it took 11, 12 years or so for me to get the confidence to write it. And I, I also needed that time away from the experiences, uh, because when you become a parent yourself and you become a grown-up, you realize that the adults in your childhood were just complicated human beings. You know, it wasn't black and white, heroes versus villains. Um, and also, you know, centering yourself in the story enough so that you're being res respectful to the, to the people who you're writing about um, also helps to outlive people when you're writing about your family. So <laughs> exercise, eat your vegetables, and just wait it out. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> I think often we think our parents have all the answers, and as we do grow up, we do realize that you know there are people like us navigating. You don't get to you know have a test run at raising children or being a parent or a caregiver, so I can imagine it's not an easy spot to be in either. And neither of you shy away from from loss in your books either. I was fine reading both of your books until about the last hundred, maybe last fifty <laughs> pages, and then I texted my friend who I think is in the audience, and I was like. It's Thursday night and I'm crying in my living room <laughs> because I had just finished the last few pages of Sunshine. So as you're writing, as you're creating and becoming vulnerable, how do you process those emotions? Because it, it can't be an easy thing to be containing and you put them on these pages, but how do you, how do you go about getting there? Uh, you really do relive the emotions again. Um, so even though you know, we're writing about challenging, traumatic experiences, we're also writing about really joyful and happy memories as well. And so when I finished Hey Kiddo, and then also when I f was finishing Sunshine, there was this other level of mourning the loss of time I was getting to have with these people again because they were on the page. And they were, there are definitely times when you're, in the, uh, you're drawing, because not only we're writing it, we're, we're, we're drawing it. And drawing takes a, a lot longer <clears throat> to really be face to face with these people again. So I'm as joyful as reliving those joyful moments and as, as sad and devastated when there were devastating moments. Yeah, I, yeah I, growing up the, the sad stories were all the stories that we would tell around the table, but because we were a bunch of just goof off storytellers in my family, we kind of make them funny, you know, because you have to cope with things in some kind of way and so humor is just, this cope mechanism, especially in my family. And so we would tell these stories and year after year, you know, uh, I'd get up and I'd tell one story and then of course somebody in the family would yell the family motto, which is, hey, that's not how that happened. And you're like, oh, then you tell it and then they would tell it and then you would get more information and it was just, so eventually you would have this story that was really fun and joyful, but then when it came down to like telling the story, it's like, oh, you know, you have to peel that all away for a second and go back to the root of that, that moment 
and really explain, because it's not going to make any sense me laughing about, you know, going to the cemetery and doing what we did at the cemetery. Don't, no spoilers. <laughs> but yeah, if I just tell that story as a joke story, it would be horrible. And, and it only worked in my family. But having the opportunity to go back and like just peel it away to the bare bones and really understand what was going on. My editor was just dogged about, about that because she kept asking me, she was well, how, what did you feel at this moment, this frame? What were you thinking? And I was like, I'm like, oh, don't make me do that. Don't make me think about that for right now. But she did, and she was really, really good about like saying, like, just think about that kid going through that thing at that moment and tell me what was that kid thinking about. And then it was just like, again, for me, very cathartic to be like, oh, okay, now I remember. Now it's coming back to me. It's not a joke. It's, you know, it's, it's important. And that you know, maybe later we could joke about it kind of like we did. So, Awesome. So let's go back to that kid. You, in your book, explore who you are as a person, as a Mexican, as an American, as a person. When did you feel Mexican enough? Um, <laughs> actually, I have a little thing that says Mexican enough. Um, uh, you know, I think what I've discovered, because this came up really, really early on when I first met my editor over the phone, and she's like, what do you want me to call your Peter or Pedro? And I was like, oh, that's a really good question because that's the question that every like, first generation kid has is like, where do you land? What, what are you choosing? Are you gonna be your, your people from home or are you gonna be your people here? And so I had to, as I'm writing the book, I'm deciding, you know, it, it actually happened within the writing of the book when I kind of figured out what I was and who I was. Um, but I, I've discovered it's just, it's an aspirational process to being Mexican to being whatever you are from. It's something that you'll never fully achieve, no matter how hard you try, but it's just this idea of like enjoying the ride, getting there kind of thing, and learning what you can, and being as much and as little as you want to be kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of, I, no answer for you. Sorry. <laughs> long, long. That's okay. I knew it was a, 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 it was a, a yeah. heavy question to It was a navigate. gotcha question. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I experienced it growing up, you know, yeah. like when you're gonna be Kurdish enough, when you're gonna be American enough, and as a third culture kid, you kind of live in that, awkward in between, not quite one or the other at all. I know we have a few minutes left. I think we're going to do some audience Q&A. Sweet. Right here in the front. Hi, I'm asking this of both of you. Did you have a particular person, a reader in mind, as you were writing it, or are you writing it to get it out and it sort of doesn't matter who reads it? So let me just repeat the, repeat question. the question. So she's asking if they had a specific reader in mind as they were going through the process of writing the book, or if they were just writing it for a general audience? I, I feel like it's sort of a selfish endeavor that we get a lot of plaudits for being generous for. Like, I just feel like I'm writing to entertain myself and to deal with my stories. And I'm lucky enough that if I'm writing about something like a goofy lunch lady who fights crime, kids can be entertained by that. And also people who might be dealing with a similar set of circumstances could also relate to that. Um, so I guess, I guess in a way it's like I'm writing for the kid that I was because I know the kid that I was is out there. I was, that, great question, great answer. Great <laughs> question, great answer, great repeat of the question. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was originally just writing it because I wanted to tell the story, but like I said, at, especially towards the end, I started realizing, oh, somebody else is gonna read this. You know, somebody, this is going out to the world and I really should be careful, not careful as in a bad way, but be full of care uh, for the reader. And I started to re recognize like, well, this this will really resonate with people who are kind of like you're saying, the third, you know, the, the first generation, those people who were looking for answers and needing to see somebody else also looking for answers. So yeah, so towards the end, I kind of feel like, oh, okay, I'm, I, I think I'm helping here. It's not just me having fun and telling my story, but I think it's, it's gonna be a little bit more towards the end with, for everybody else. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Right here in the front in the pink. So she's asking if his books are available, Pedro's books are available in Spanish. And, and Jared's. And Jared's. <laughs> uh, Lunch Lady is in Spanish, but it's published in Spain. Okay. So 
So it's, a, it's, a, it's got a little different. Uh, Jedi Academy is available in Spanish. And my memoir, Hey Kiddo, has been translated to other languages, but I'm not sure it's Spanish just yet. Mine's, uh, yeah, it might, uh, it's coming out in November in Spanish, Spain. Spain, Spanish. So, yeah. Thanks. All right, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. In the back, in the sunglasses. So could you repeat the last part of that? Uh, what kind of training do you have to develop the skill of drawing to express your mind? So he's asking what type of skills you've developed to do your drawings that you know come from your brain into your hand and onto yeah. the print material. So is, it, is that for both of us? OK. Um, I, I went to the, uh, the, the wonderful School of Art at Hallmark uh, for many years. And I was uh, lucky to be surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of some of the best artists in the world. And it was just like, you could just go to anybody and just get like you know, coaching. You know, anybody would, would talk to you, which was amazing. It was like grad school with pay. It was the, the best thing ever. But then it also said, said to you, like, how do you make yourself different? How are you gonna stand out and be you know, your own voice? And so. So that journey kind of started, like, I, I need to develop my own thing. I need to look and sound like me. And it really didn't start kicking in until after I left, when I was away from everybody, and I decided, like, I need to just develop this my, my own way. And, uh, you know, of course, I did research and looked at other people's work, but I was kind of, like, in that basement just trying to work things out, and it just took hours and hours to figure out what this voice was going to be like. Um, so that's kind of where, where I worked it out. I'm sure uh, similarly, like what we do now is just a direct connection to what we were doing when we were little kids, you know, sketching and drawing all the time. So, so for me, I, I drew all the time as a kid after school on the weekends. Uh, I took some art classes after school on the weekends, starting in sixth grade through high school. I went to college to study art, and you know, uh, it's just constantly still learning because um, I'm constantly developing my art style. It's it's constantly evolving. Uh, in, the, in the case of memoir, you know, I definitely worked to find photographs of the actual environments so that when I drew them, it looked like the real place. But even made up environments, so if when I'm making the lunch lady books, like I do have stacks of photographs. I've, you know, lunch ladies have invited me into their kitchen so I could photograph their industrial mixtures. <laughs> and that's equally as important to have it look like an authentic space. So I have a question for Jarrett. So in Hey Kiddo, you're talking about uh, trying to get uh, into RISD? Yes. And one of the, the tests for RISD, you had three images you had to draw? Yes. And one of them was a bicycle? Correct, yeah. Can you draw a bicycle today? I'm awful at drawing bicycles. Good, yeah. I don't, I don't okay, that, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll bounce it off. I hate drawing mechanical things, yeah, like cars. Like I love drawing people, creatures, organic things. What do you dislike drawing the most and what do you like? Motorhomes. Motorhomes. <laughs> <laughs> so similar. You did a great yeah. job though. Well, I had a lot of reference. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's like when I saw that thing, I got the, you know, the cold sweats. I'm like, oh, I would, I would never have gotten into RISD. It's, it's mechanical stuff. It's horses from the knee down. It's, uh, you know. No centaurs. Centaur, you know, centaurs. <laughs> Women with short hair, for some reason, I just can't. Oh, this, that's not a man, everybody. It's got a, uh, so that's how I. Awesome, thank you. Before I close this out, I know our time is up. I just want to leave you with this from. That was not, the, you should have read that before we got here, man. I know, oh. I know. <laughs> It's like, hold on, I see the finish line. Bye, sunshine. Um, <laughs> time here with one another is a gift that should be acknowledged and appreciated. It's very short, it's very sweet, but that, I don't know. I mean, I read the entire book, and that really did resonate with me. So I hope you all appreciate your time here at the National Book Festival. Please join me in thanking Pedro Martin and Jarrett J. Krasowska today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.